No balloons allowed. One day I was having lunch with a friend of mine, and he described to me what I thought was a good example of the commandments of men that are described in Isaiah 29 and Mark 7. Perhaps an example that would be easier for us to relate to. He described how he had walked into the church where he served, and one of the first things he saw was a sign on the door to their fellowship hall that said, No balloons allowed. What do you think? Is this a commandment of God or of men? And at first, when you hear a rule like that, your first impression and what my friend thought was, this place must be no fun. They must not like joy because that's to him what that sign communicated. And of course, later on, he and I learned, as is true with most signs that are placed in different places at churches and other, other buildings, There was a reason it got put up in the first place that isn't as unreasonable as you first thought. In this case, someone had had a birthday party with balloons, and one had escaped and gone up to the 35-foot ceiling and destroyed a ceiling fan by getting its string caught in the and burned out the motor. So you can imagine with a room that big and a ceiling that high, it was quite a bit of work to fix it, and someone decided no more balloons. Now, you might still, like my friend, understand that reasoning and still think it isn't a good look to put a sign up banning balloons. Yet, I mention this because it's precisely this kind of commandment that God is talking about in our Old Testament reading from Isaiah 29 and what Jesus is dealing with in Mark chapter 7. As the example of my friend's church demonstrates, It's still something that occurs among the people of God to this very day. Now, you might be wondering how exactly balloons have any relation to the book of Isaiah. So let's start there and trace this thread up to today. Now, while we're doing this, we will see that God provides a solution to this trap of sinful humanity, this thing we're all drawn into, this particular trap of sin, where we create a rule And we have reasons for the rule we've created, but we end up placing adherence to our own rules above adherence to the commandments that God gives us. So to get to the issue in Isaiah, we first look at verse 13. Verse 13 sums up the context of what God is addressing in His people quite well. So what's the problem? Verse 13, and the Lord said, because this people draws near with their mouth and honors me with their lips while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. So the problem in Isaiah 29 is that the people, they're worshiping God, they're going through all the motions, but not truly. Here God defines true worship as one of a sincere heart, a heart that is near to God. The people are on the outside, looks like they're doing all the things. They're going through the motions, they're singing, they're praying, they're making their sacrifices, but not in true faith and fear of God, but rather they're afraid of violating the commandments of men and the traditions of their community. In verse 15 and 16, he continues to describe the sad state of affairs of those who are worshiping God while their hearts are far from Him. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, who say, who sees us, who knows us, you turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me, or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? Here we get to the heart of the issue. In order for someone to take a commandment of men and with it supplant the commandment of God, they must have an upside-down view of their relationship to God. God is the potter and we are the clay. How is it that we can tell the one who made us, hey, this isn't how this works, or you formed me incorrectly, you formed the church incorrectly? So God sends Isaiah as his prophet to tell his people that he's unhappy with their worship because it isn't the worship of a humble and broken heart that fears God. It has instead been replaced with the vain and prideful worship of a heart that values its own rules above those 
of God. Now let's jump forward in time to Jesus in Mark chapter 7. Here we have a confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees about this same sinful tendency of mankind. Now here Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees because His disciples are eating food with unclean hands. Now before you think this is simply a hygiene dispute and the disciples had nasty gunk all over their hands and they're like, why are you letting them eat that way? The text clarifies in verses 3 and 4 with a little parenthetical explanation that it's not referring to that, it's referring to the ritual washing, and not just that, but ritual washing that has been established by a tradition of the elders, or as Jesus later puts it, simply by men. Now, this exchange begins with the Pharisees asking this question of Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands. And there's one of those texts where you think Jesus is just a nice guy. You might want to cover your ears for the next part. Jesus' response is to quote from Isaiah 29, verse 13, which we just read before, while calling them hypocrites. Here's what He said, "'Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors Me with their lips, but their heart is far from Me.'" In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. You see, just like in Isaiah 25, they're going through the motions of worship, but not with humble and contrite hearts that fear God. In fact, they've departed from God's Word to the extent that they have done more than simply leave it behind. See, Jesus continues in His rebuke of them by citing a specific example that was going on at the time of how they've even used their man-made traditions to make void the Word of God. In verses 10 and 11 of our gospel reading, He describes the use of what's called Corban, which is a commandment of men that is used as a loophole to avoid the commandment of God of honoring your father and mother. If something is Corban, it is given to God and can no longer be used by others. And so, let's say that you didn't really get along with your parents and you think that they made your life terrible, and you don't really want to honor them. Well, you can just say that the stuff that you were going to give to your parents is Corban, and now you are lawfully flouting God's Word. It's totally fine in the eyes of everybody else around you, but Jesus is saying here, it's not good. This commandment of men allowed someone to lawfully disobey God's law by declaring it a gift to God. So let's get back to our balloons, or rather, lack of balloons. The truth is, every church has a rule like the balloon rule at my friend's church, man-made rules that have some reason, in some cases, good reason they're established. The church is meant to operate in good order. So the rules themselves are not bad, but they all carry the same danger our God is warning of us today, the danger of becoming the reason we leave God's Word behind, even becoming a loophole that gives us reason to make the Word of God void in our own lives. Consider a couple of maybe more relatable examples than Corbin. Let's start with a balloon rule. Consider a scenario where a new family from the congregation, or even a visitor who has relatives in the congregation but is unchurched, uses the fellowship hall for their child's birthday party. They didn't know about the rule, or perhaps the sign was put on a door and the door was propped open and they didn't see it, and they bring in a bunch of balloons. Oh no. And one of the congregation members decides to reprimand them and show them the sign even if no similar disaster which spawned the sign in the first place has even occurred. In this instance, in observance of their own rule, have they not left behind the Word of God which calls us to love our neighbors as ourselves and consider others' needs before our own in order to hold up this rule? Or consider the example, and this one I think is probably true in every single church there is, making sure you close the fridge in the kitchen. 
Most church kitchens, for good reasons, have lots of signs up about how best to take care of the equipment and appliances. It's a shared space. A lot of people use it. It makes sense. Yet, if our response to the violation of those rules would be to raise it above the level of how God's Word calls us to deal with such situations, then we get into the dangerous territory that Jesus warns us of today. This is why you perhaps have I hope not, but probably have been a part of a fight in a church about something that everyone in less bound up times would agree is quite silly and not that important, and yet massive damage can result from it. Rule and the order in the church life are not bad, but Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees and Isaiah is sent to warn us and the people of God in His time that when our own orders and rules cause us to leave behind God's Word or even violate it, disaster, damage ensues. Now, clearly this is a problem that spans time and space. It's in Isaiah's time, it's in Jesus' time, and it's in our time. So what is God going to do with His stubborn and sinful people who seem to regularly forget this lesson? Well, the good news is He's had a plan from the very beginning, and it's been the same all along. So to answer this question, we'll jump back to our text in Isaiah 29. In verse 14, God describes what He will do for this unfaithful and hypocritical people. Here's what He says. So this is after verse 13, and it's connected with a therefore. So because of all the things I said in verse 13, these people who can't get worship right, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people. With wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of the wise men shall perish, and the discernment of the discerning men shall be hidden. This is Paul's, the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God, and the foolishness of God is wiser than the world. You see, what Jesus is here to tell the Pharisees and us and what Isaiah was meant to point to Jesus about is that God's response to our unfaithful and hypocritical worship is to do wonderful things again and again with us and for us. Now, I read things like that, and I'm so thankful for our wonderful and gracious God because that is not how I would respond. I don't think it's how you would respond, and perhaps you can remember a specific time in a church where one of these man-made rules were violated, and you did not respond by doing more wonderful things again and again. It's okay. You're in good company. We're all in the same boat. So what wonderful things is He going to do? And here we get our answer at the end of the Isaiah reading in verse 18 and 19. In that day, The deaf shall hear the words of the book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. This is, of course, referring to what Jesus comes to do. He opens our ears to hear what God's Word says. That's what He's doing for the Pharisees there. Their ears have been blocked by the tradition of men. He opens our eyes to see in faith what God is doing for us. All of us who are treated as nothing in the world, the meek, we shall enjoy the joy of the Lord. For God has not forgotten us. And He hasn't judged us according to His law. He hasn't judged us according to our hypocrisy and our unfaithful worship. Instead, He has freed us from the condemnation of that law through His Son, Jesus, who has brought us to God's gracious gospel. He has brought us the good news that we who sometimes bicker over stupid things We who sometimes lose our way in worship or at different times in our lives are drawn away to value those things that are less important over the most important things. He will do wonderful things again and again for us and through us so that our hearts, which are continually drawn to tell our Maker 
He did not make me, or I know better than you, form me a different way. We are set free from our blindness. Dear friends in Christ, be on guard against overvaluing our own rules and the commandments of men. Your hearts are drawn to do this. But likewise, do not despair if you fall into this trap of sin, but rest secure in the knowledge that even when you fail and your heart is drawn away from God, He sends Jesus to pursue you and redeem you, to open your ears to hear God's Word and your eyes to see His wonders, so that you shall exult and have joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. In His name. Amen.